And welcome back, everybody, to Exploring Faith, Pursuing Grace. Uh, my name is Daniel Rogers, and I just thank you so much for uh, joining us on our podcast week after week. Today, we have an exciting guest, uh, Dr. John Young. He is a professor at Amherst University, and I had the privilege of taking a class on church history from him a few semesters ago. We're not going to let him divulge what kind of student I was. Uh, that's uh, confidential, but... <laughs> <laughs> I just appreciate yeah, it because of, of, of FERPA, I can, I can neither confirm nor deny that Daniel was in my class, but if he was, I'm sure he did well. Yeah, right. All right. <laughs> uh, but I was really impressed with a lot of his material and uh, we had some good conversations that stemmed from some of the comments that I left on the discussion boards and things like that. And he gave me good grades on my essay. So I thought, hey, we'll let him come on and uh, join us on the podcast. So, uh, John, how are you doing today? Doing well. It's good to be here. Um, it has been, uh, I guess, about a year or so, right, since you were in my class. I, I was thinking it was somewhere uh, around the time Nathan was born, either the semester before or semester after, sort of a, a whirlwind period of my life. I know it has been for you as well, uh, yeah. but it's good to, to be able to take some time to chat with you today. Yeah, I think I think it was the spring semester. I can't remember if it was spring or winter of 2021. It's, it all just runs together. Uh, like, a, like you, I've had a child in the last year, and a little boy who's getting used to daycare still. And so, you know, it's, it's been, it's been quite the adventure, uh, but here we are. So uh, I know that most people listening to this pod podcast probably haven't attended Emory's university. Uh, they may not keep up with the top historians out of the university of Alabama. So they probably don't know about, about yourself. So uh, why don't you give us a little thumbnail sketch of your ministry uh, websites we could go to things like that. Sure. Um, well, I, I live in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, but I teach with Amherst University, which is uh, located at physical campus in Montgomery, uh, the state's capital. Uh, I grew up in Florence, so I've been in Alabama for my whole life. Went to Marsville Bible School, which is associated with the Churches of Christ, uh, kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, originally came to Alabama, to Tuscaloosa, expecting to become a lawyer and uh, went through undergrad, uh, history, political science degrees, and got to law school, absolutely hated it. So I was sort of casting around for uh, what I wanted to do. And uh, I had loved my studies in history. So I signed up to do uh, a master's uh, and then a PhD in history. Uh, but I wasn't really sure what I wanted to study. And the uh, first you know, semester or two, I was uh, kind of casting about for topics for papers and you know, doing my readings for classes and these sorts of things. And um, ultimately, I Came across a book. Uh, it was really not actually a restoration movement or Stone Campbell movement history book, uh, but it talked a little bit about the the history of Harding University and, and kind of its place in the state of state of Arkansas and and, and populist history, economic history, and these sorts of things. And uh, I, I had this kind of light bulb moment where I was like, oh, I guess I could actually study church history stuff for you know for a living. Apparently, people can do that. <laughs> and uh, and so I kind of I kind of fell into it backwards, and then uh, did some research uh, for master's level, then uh, doctoral level, uh, history related to the Stone Campbell movement. Uh, graduated, finished a PhD, uh, I guess about two and a half years ago, had already started adjuncting with Amherst University, which as you know, uh, is associated with the Churches of Christ. Uh, it is an online or distance education program, uh, and I teach at the School of Theology there, um, teach a variety of church history classes. I teach our U.S. history survey classes, these sorts of things. Um, also, uh, have worked in college and young professionals ministry, uh, really for most of the last decade. I took about a year off uh, when I was first starting full time with Amridge, uh, but uh, working with basically sort of eighteen to thirty-five year olds. Uh, I was, you know, in that have been in that bracket the whole time myself, uh, and then currently work as as education director uh, at our congregation. And then finally, uh, I have a small. Uh, I guess, kind of consulting sideline that I do uh, for ministers working in uh, bivocational part-time and volunteer ministries. And that's called uh, the B-Team Consulting. So we've got a podcast and some other resources, uh, but probably e easiest way to connect with me online uh, is either through Facebook uh, or at johnyounghistorian.com, uh, which has links to everything else that I'm involved in. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, tell us about your book. What's uh, your book on the restoration movement? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I've got I've got two. One is the uh, the more recent, which is the dissertation turned academic monograph, uh, which is redrawing the blueprints for the early church historical ecclesiology in and around the Stone Campbell movement, uh, which is one of those uh, mouthfuls of a title. Right? You know, any any good kind of academic work has to uh, 
have the title, the sub, the the, the, the colon, and then the subtitle as well yeah. uh, to make sure it's uh, sufficiently boring. Uh, but that book looks at uh, some of the smaller groups associated with the restoration of Stone Campbell heritage uh, and kind of looks at their stories and puts them in, in conversation with each other and uh, thinking about how uh, restorationist understandings uh, have kind of changed over time or between groups. Yeah. Uh, but the book that I think we're wanting to talk about today is the one that probably has um, more is of more interest to a, a general readership, which is uh, Visions of Restoration, the History of Churches of Christ. And uh, this is a much shorter book, a much punchier book. And it's a book that is really intended for uh, you know, individual study, for congregational use, uh, small group settings. But uh, in that book, a little over 100 pages, uh, you know, try to aim for a little bit breezier writing style, yeah. uh, but it is intended for use, and it's to overview, essentially from the time of, of, of Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell, uh, Barton Stone, Walter Scott, uh, really up to, you know, into the early 2000s in the history of the Churches of Christ, um, both the successes and the divisions and struggles that we have uh, encountered along the way, and it's really meant for readers who maybe have spent time in Churches of Christ, maybe find themselves there currently, uh, but don't necessarily know as much about our history, uh, maybe have never had the opportunity to take uh, a church history class or, or something of that sort. Yeah, I found the discussion questions at the end of each section super helpful, and uh, I could see how that would just be awesome in a small group uh, just to get the conversation started and and really help people discover uh, what our heritage is. And that's one thing is you hear these names dropped from time to time, Alexander Campbell, Barton W. Stone, but like we really don't know those guys. You know, we they're sort of used as mascots to like say, let's restore the church, but we don't really know all about what their mindset was, what their goals were, what their dreams and aspirations were, their successes, their failures, like you've talked about here. And so, yeah, I think that's a great resource for people who want to get started. Um, You know, the, the uh, church history book that I was first introduced to for the Stone Campbell back when I was in high school, uh, early college was, uh, Seek the Old Paths, I think it was called, or no, In Search of the Ancient Order. That's what it was, yeah. um, In Search of the Ancient Order. And then a few years ago, I became uh, acquainted with um, Leroy Garrett's book called The Stone Campbell Movement. And so that was super helpful. But again, that's pretty deep with, with lots of uh, quotations and things like that, um, You know, getting into their original documents and whatnot. And so having your book as sort of like an introduction to the Stone Campbell movement, I think is so, so helpful for, pe for people. And also you're just an awesome guy that uh, they can reach out to and ask questions to. And when you're not taking kids to the daycare, um, uh, grading essays and helping people with their dissertations, you can uh, answer questions about Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone. So, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a busy week. This is actually our finals week. So I, yeah. I was uh, grading papers. I had just dropped Nathan off of preschool was grading a couple of papers before we uh, jumped off for this conversation today. But yeah, yeah. Um, and, and one of the things that I think is really um, not to toot my own horn, but it's maybe a little bit helpful with the book or useful about the book is that it actually was generated from me teaching a class uh, at, at our congregation. It was not a book that I had originally planned or had any goal of writing. Um, yeah. I just decided uh, that I was going to teach a, a restoration movement history class. And I had a, basically a summer term, you know, the, the, the sacred 13 weeks, uh, yes. <laughs> you know, for, for a church curriculum uh, to fill. And, uh, you know, I, I had ended up with this material and uh, I thought, well, this doesn't exactly fit in the dissertation, which I was working on at the time. Um, you know, it, it, it's more context than, than what I need for, uh, for a project like that, but I hate to let it go to waste. So, you know, had an opportunity to workshop it a couple of times and uh, yeah, a family great. member of mine taught at his congregation as well. And uh, it has, you know, you've mentioned uh, Leroy Garrett's work and uh, as well as Earl West, Search for the Ancient Order. Um, but the, the, the end of this book, the Visions of Restoration book, has an essay with it as well, uh, kind of a suggested readings list. Um, I don't really do a lot of thorough footnoting in that particular book. It's not one that has a Kind of exhaustive bibliography, uh, but there is a short essay there. So if readers are interested, like you know, if, if they come across a line in the book and they're like, "Well, it really needs more explanation because this book is only a hundred pages long," um, yeah. they can turn to the back and, and kind of read through the essay and and find some titles suggested there. And I tried to pick ones that would be um, you know representative in some way or that could in turn point readers if they like really really wanted to jump into you know off the off the deep end on a particular topic uh, that they would have the option of doing that there, yeah, but it wouldn't get bogged down in the, in the material itself. That's awesome. And it also sort of 
lets you introduce these characters to them and then they can do the difficult research themselves you know if yep. they're interested they they can really uh you know apply the elbow grease or whatever and dig into the restoration movement history and have a lot of fun it's it's a super rewarding process because i know for me as i was reading through some of the earlier um articles and things like that and the millennial harbinger and uh, the christian messenger and all this sort of stuff you're you're going wait a minute uh, that's where that came from you know like that's where we got that that's so cool <laughs> you know yeah I, I, thinking about even like the millennial harbinger um i remember uh actually when i was teaching the class that uh, that that ultimately uh, became the Visions of Restoration book. Uh, when we started talking about the the, the pre and amillennial split that happened within Churches of Christ, uh, you know, yeah. kind of in the early 20th century, I had to go back and then sort of explain. Okay, there's there's different perspectives on the on the millennium, right? There, <laughs> the, you know, we, we actually kind of started largely as a post millennial movement, yeah. which is why you know a harbinger is something that brings about something. You know, Campbell's paper, the millennial harbinger, right, is, is sort of working towards bringing about. Uh, a particular kind of eschatological vision and, uh, and then we could kind of go back and say well now we're largely at all millennial but not not exclusively that uh, you know went through this split with premillennials and and just you know trying to explain some of that terminology and trying to do so in a way that uh, doesn't cause eyes to glaze over uh, yeah. and that also uh, you know it, it, that doesn't get too bogged down in you know in 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 those things but it can point readers again to, to sources that uh, that might be helpful for them outside of the book itself oh yeah and to me to me the diversity uh in eschatologies in the earlier uh, churches of christ and the stone camel movement specifically uh, is is not a source of frustration for me it's actually more of a source of comfort like oh good like people can disagree and get along <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> you know I thought it sort of had to be my way so I'm glad uh, you know glad to see that attitude portrayed in our history and it, you know, yeah, some and of, that's really one of the points. one of the main ideas of the book is yeah. that um, it's easy for us, kind of in retrospect, um, you know, whatever sort of doctrinal positions, theological positions we take today, um, you know, conservative, progressive, otherwise, um, and those terms themselves, obviously, they don't need a lot of definition. What do they but, even mean? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but it's easy for us to sort of key in on particular aspects of our history, whether it's sort of people who are more maybe kind of pattern oriented, restoration minded, you can go back in the historical record and you can find that if you're more unity minded, you know, kind of, you, know you can go back and you can find that there as well. Um, you know, if, if you're kind of various, you know, millennial leanings one way or the other, you can go back and you can find kind of precedent for that view. Uh, yeah. You can go back and find precedent for the other views as well. Um, that again, really in that in Visions Restoration book, as well as in Redrawing the Blueprints, um, you know, without sort of weighing in too heavily on my own views on these different issues, um, what I really am trying to show is just that this thing, this movement is a lot more varied uh, than than we usually give it credit for being. Um, sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad, right? Yeah. The, the, just because something existed in the past doesn't necessarily mean that it was a good thing or that it should be perhaps a model uh, for us today, uh, but it is to say that the story is a lot more uh, complex, uh, and, the, and the individuals involved were a lot more complex uh, than sometimes we, we boil them down to be. Yeah, and that's again, that's just so so interesting. And I I I had I had a blast uh, reading through uh, restoration history, you know, a few years ago, especially last fall. I got into it a little bit, uh, a little bit more than I ever had before, and was just eating it up. And wrote a little essay. Uh, on some of the findings that that I came across, but it is true that you can be a bit selective when you're pulling these quotations from restoration history. And when you do that, you're actually sort of, you know, maybe sending the wrong message that this is at, this is how it was when really that's just part of the story. Because I mean, look, uh, you can see behind me on the shelf, they can't see this, but you know, there's all the millennial harbinger, like really you can capture the entire view of the restoration movement in four or five quotations, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's just one paper from one person who had more yeah. than one paper. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, we, as historians, this is the thing that we deal with, not just as church historians or restoration movement historians, but historians in general, right? We, we all have to make very difficult choices about, um, you know, what, what sources we use, about what quotations we use, about how we handle and interpret those sources. Um, you know, we, we make arguments, we, we make, you know, we, we share our interpretations of the data, um, but we also are kind of implicitly making an argument by which things we select, right? If I, if I talk about Alexander Campbell, 
um, but but uh, Walter Scott, or you know, or if I've you know, I, I did a lot of research on a group known as the Christadelphians. If I don't, if I talk about John Thomas, that's a it's a completely different sort of stream uh, of, of our movement's heritage. Uh, and, and, but if I don't talk about them, then it's like, well, that I, I'm sort of obscuring the fact that they even existed. Um, right. We, we, it, there's just so much, right? And the historian's job. That's why it's such a difficult uh, job in some respects, right? Is that we're having to make these choices. Um, you know, to the best of our abilities, right? We, we try to read widely. We try to to accurately um, portray what we find, right? That that we're that we're not trying to sort of hide the ball, right? It's not sort of a shell game or something. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, we, we we can't cover all of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> we have to make make choices about it. Yeah, and that's uh that's something that we've seen a lot in Civil War history as well, which I know we're gonna get to the civil war here in a little bit uh, possibly if we have time but uh yeah. is you can paint the civil war it was slavery versus abolition but that is way oversimplified as you know um i was reading a book by uh, wendell berry here recently the need to be whole and he goes through some letters that he found uh written from different sides of the civil war uh near his near where he lives in kentucky and he was talking about how much more complicated it was than people try to make it out to be and to say it was good versus evil or whatever um you know in maybe some way it could be true but really it's far more complicated than we tend to think and so having that respect for historians of going okay i know that what i'm reading is biased because we're all biased um but I also know they're trying to do the best they can with what they've got <laughs> you know it's uh, it would be impossible yeah. to to give ev- to to um give a little biography of every single person in restoration movement history that had an impact on how we view the world today. And to expect that of a historian is, uh, is not really being very fair. Um, yeah. Yeah. But we're all going to be biased. The key is yeah. to be aware of those biases and to, to try to push back against them as we have uh, opportunity. Uh, sometimes no, knowing is in fact, half of the battle um, yeah. that if we can sort of lay our cards on the table, you know, here, here's what I'm studying here. Here's sort of my background. Here's where I'm coming from to this, um, you know, readers can kind of make of it uh, as they will. And, you know, certainly there's, there's shortcomings for all of our work, but uh, you know, you mentioned the, the Civil War question, and I will we'll probably circle back around to this again in more of a restoration movement uh, or Stone Campbell movement context. But, uh, you know, even there, I, I took like two or three grad level classes on Civil War history because uh, my training is as a U.S. historian, a historian of American religion. And um, just thinking about the ways in which the aims of the war change in a four and a half year period, right? That what the Union is fighting for in the early uh, early stages of the war is very different in some ways, uh, yeah. you know, preserving the union versus eventually you know emancipation uh, and abolition do become goals uh, but they don't necessarily start that way at least for uh, a majority of kind of the political leadership and for a majority of soldiers and so um, even in a four and a half year period quite a bit changed and of course when we think about church history or movement history and stretching out you know decades centuries millennia um, you know it, it becomes even more difficult of a task uh, but fortunately again um, you know, as historians, right, we, we have methods we follow, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an academic field, you know, we, we, we have things that we can do, um, you know, peer review, um, you know, historical methodology to try to make sure that uh, that what we do is is, is helpful, is valid, uh, and that it holds up to, to scrutiny. Yeah, that, that's awesome. That's great information for our listeners, not just uh, for this podcast, but for all of our podcasts, you know, every person that we bring on to interview, um, it's it's good to understand where they're coming from and what they're trying to accomplish. Right. Um, all right. So let's go ahead and sort of start talking about the restoration movement. Um, let's start with that. How about that? Uh, I've said Stone Campbell movement. I've said restoration movement. I think you've used both terms as well. What's the difference in those terms and what do you prefer and does it matter? Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll take the last of that uh, first, which is to say, yes, I use both terms. I use them mostly interchangeably. Uh, and uh, for me, I, I, I do that because both terms have their limitations. Um, I'm going to do what I call the motorcycle through the museum real quick, uh, okay. which is the, the, the really quick uh, overview of this. 
So 19th century, kind of the first books that are written about what we might now call Stone Campbell movement history were pretty much biographical in nature. Robert Richardson wrote a big doorstop of a book uh, about Alexander Campbell. Um, you know, there were biographical treatments of, of Martin Stone and some of the others. Um, and then it's really at kind of the late 19th century into the turn of the 20th century that we start seeing uh, particularly among the disciples of Christ, uh, trained historians, many of them uh, coming out of the University of Chicago, um, who who tried to bring a more systematic approach to the study of our movement's history, um, that uh, in a lot of ways they were the first to sort of identify that that restoration and unity sometimes seem to be in conflict with, with, with each other uh, within our movement's history and heritage. Um, and then and as we go into the 20th century, you know, we get the split between the disciples of Christ, the churches of Christ, and the historians of those different groups um, in some ways have different interpretations of, well, who's sort of the, in the right, who, who is kind of the schismatic group that, that broke off and did something incorrect. Um, you know, you get, you mentioned uh, Earl West's book earlier, Search for Ancient Order, which is, again, a big four volume uh, set, a uh, wonderful historical scholarship there. Um, but it does take a very clear, like, restoration is... The name of the game, um, you know, if, if, for those who were not kind of part of Churches of Christ after the 1906 split, um, they're, they're sort of in the wrong, and this is kind of the real yeah. trajectory, right? The, the, it, but then on the other side, right, you could point to, to other historians who sort of say, well, no, the disciples were the normative group. Um, they're kind of more ecumenically minded, um, you know, more open to, you know, biblical criticism, these sorts of things. And then the churches of Christ were the cantankerous, uh, you know, hard, yeah. hard to get along with, you know, the crusty farmers, right, um, <laughs> that that you get you know these two streams um and, but you also then kind of in more recent decades you get people trying to sort of bring the story back together um you mentioned Leroy Garrett's work where where Garrett um you know really emphasizes the presence of unity within the thought uh, of some of the founding generation and, and subsequent leaders as well uh, but even things like the encyclopedia of the Stone Campbell movement a uh, Stone Campbell movement of global history uh and more recent books which are trying to tell a more uh in some ways all-encompassing story um, without kind of weighing in as much maybe on like, you know, well, is it churches of Christ or is it disciples of Christ that were right? It was like, well, no, they're, they're both from the same uh, kind of milieu and uh, telling the story of the movement the whole involves all of those. So to your original question, which is, uh, do I prefer restoration movement or do I prefer Stone Campbell movement? One of the benefits of the name restoration movement is that, um, you know, it's familiar. It's been in pretty wide use for quite some time. Sometimes you also see this with American restoration movement as well as a little bit more of a clarifier. Um, yes. But if you only say restoration movement, right, it, it, it kind of loses out. You, you don't get a sense of who's involved necessarily. Um, it doesn't emphasize the idea of the presence of unity within the thought uh, or of the eschatological views, right, which were <laughs> a real driving force. Um, if yeah. you also just say restoration movement, uh, it, you know, you have other restoration movements. The Latter-day Saints are a restoration movement and they're, you know, very, you know, somewhat different understanding of the canon, but what they're trying to restore, right. but it's restorationist in general. Um, so then you have a term like Stone Campbell movement, on the other hand, which uh, Leroy Garrett's work did much to, to popularize and certainly is, I think, probably the more common uh, scholarly uh, name associated for the movement uh, today. Uh, but I have, so, you know, there's some shortcomings with it as well, because it doesn't give you a sense necessarily of what the ideas or the motivating factors of the group are. Um, even there, it kind of implies maybe a unity between Stone and Campbell themselves, which when was they not never present, met. Because, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 They, 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 and, and Campbell was actually very hesitant about uh, kind of linking up with Stone in, in some ways. It's actually some of Campbell's followers who uh, meet up with some of Stone's followers instead. It also, does you know in the same way that restoration movement overshadows puts restoration over unity stone campbell movement by not mentioning restoration or again the eschatological views which are really uh important it, it leaves out stuff too it doesn't include the contributions of walter scott and you know many others of the of that early generation uh doesn't take into account how barton stone kind of in some ways went in a different direction later in his own life and, and was associated with other groups as well um, so I use both of them, uh, you know, a lot of the times if I've given the choice, I'll do Stone Campbell restoration movement, but then that gets to kind of, uh, you know, it, it's, it takes a while to say it, it takes a while to write it out. Uh, yeah. so, um, just when you, when you use either of those terms, just be aware that, uh, they are limited. They have their own, um, limitations that the name doesn't necessarily encompass the entirety of the movement, uh, whichever one you choose, but then also, uh, and then I'll, 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 I'll hand the ball back to you here um sure. <laughs> is that 
when we study history, when we study human experience, it's really, really easy for us to get caught up on terminology and yeah. to not actually discuss and to study the things that we're trying to study, right? I have to use some kind of phrase to talk about this historical movement of, of church history, of which I am part, of which you're part. Um, the terms have their shortcomings, but we can still use them despite the shortcomings. Right. Uh, and that, that's why I don't, I, I don't usually get too, too hung up on, uh, on either of those. Um, one book, my title uses restoration. The other uses Stone Campbell movement. Um, when I teach the class uh, at Ambridge, the grad level class, I use the terms interchangeably and just give a, a spiel sort of like I just gave here. Yeah, so the whole point is that, uh, you know, language is just supposed to communicate <laughs> to our audience the idea we have in mind. And no term can adequately in one or two words describe all that took place between the early 1800s and, <laughs> you know, the 2022. And so... Uh, having a term like restoration movement and Stone Campbell movement, though they may not fully capture everything that happened during that time, they're sufficient enough to get the point across to whoever you're talking to. Like, hey, this is the point of history uh, that I'm talking about. And what's interesting, you mentioned the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Uh, in Florida, we had a lot more um, Mormon missionaries come by our house than we ever had before. And they don't prefer the term Mormon uh, nowadays, but, you know, that's, again, Stone Campbell Movement, Restoration Movement. What do people know, right? And one of the things that they asked me when they, in our very first meeting was, why are there so many churches? And I just thought to myself, okay, you don't want to play this game because I know this game very well, you know? <laughs> and yeah, so, and it's interesting that, you know, that, that sort of the Latter-day Saints and, and kind of, uh, you know, Stone and Campbell and so many others uh, kind of within our movement's background they're they're all kind of coming around at about the same time yeah. uh there's actually there are actually some pretty notable figures sydney rigdon being one of them who kind of moved back and forth at different times between the movements um and, and in some ways they're, they're both responding to um you know kind of the, the early 19th century american you know kind of sort of the, the, the opening of you know getting getting rid of established churches that it's sort of the not quite the wild west it's the sort yeah. of kind of you know midwest and southeast and stuff you know it, it's not all the way out west just yet but um you know that, that that churches are competing for 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 converts they're competing for um but at the cost of kind of a shared mission and so you know in their own ways um you know campbell and stone uh, but also someone like joseph smith again takes it in a very different direction but they're all in some way kind of responding to denominational disunity and in, in, in competition um you know trying to get back on brand or on on, on message yeah um you know by, by kind of making it what i call an end run around church history which is to sort of say there's there's this kind of larger period of time um you know however we got to today if we kind of go back to how things used to be um whatever that looks like and again they have different <laughs> understandings of what that is um, that we can kind of get past sort of the, you know, Baptist versus Methodist versus Presbyterians versus Episcopalians versus Congregationalists, you know, versus, you know, 20 other groups, right, that are, that right. are present uh, in, in the American colonies and in, and in states. Um, they're, they're responding to something very similar, just doing so in, in you know, in somewhat different ways. Yeah, and, and they're part of, of course, a larger movement uh, that we typically call the Second Great Awakening, right? And so with all the tent meetings and you know, things like that, and uh, like you said, Western expansion, and that does kind of, oh, well, hang on, we're about to chase a huge rabbit if I even speak those words. So I'll probably refrain from doing so. I was going to say something about manifest destiny and, you know, the American dream and the term millennial harbinger and how all that fits yeah. together. Let's just forget that and let's keep going. <laughs> yeah, I, I will just interject really quickly that even <laughs> okay, yeah. even back in some of the, the early 20th century disciples of Christ historians um, were, were pretty quick to identify and to kind of follow along what we might call the Turner thesis, um, which is, again, this idea that, that in some way the American frontier had given the United States like its own kind of distinct character, right? the, the idea of exploration and pushing westward and of course yeah. it sort of ignores that there are already people living there right uh you know th th it's not necessarily <laughs> discovering new territory it's just sort of people expanding into territory that they personally had not lived in previously um but that you know for almost 100 years now um there have been places in our movement's history like written history historiography um that have kind of pointed out hey there's something 
to this idea of, of westward expansion that that for good or for ill it is sort of tied up in the history of our movement um yeah. if readers want if listeners rather want more um nathan hatch uh, the democratization of american christianity is a, is a pretty good place to, to start there cool. um, but that's a discussion for another time perhaps <laughs> awesome so all right we were uh you know talking in our private messages and uh, you shared with me uh, the manuscript for this uh, book that you'd published on the restoration movement, the vision of restoration. And you sort of presented an answer to the question, when did the churches of Christ begin in sort of a both and kind of way. Um, I know that personally growing up, I saw the chart that you mentioned a hundred times. In fact, this morning I was on Facebook and I saw the chart that you mentioned uh, in your book again. Uh, everybody that's listening probably has seen it as well. Uh, it was in the Fishers of Men um, brochures uh, growing up and things like that. And why I'm a member of the Church of Christ, something like that was in there as well. And it basically has Church of Christ, AD 33, Roman Catholic Church, like 400 or something. And then it has various dates uh, for Baptists and Lutherans and the Greek Orthodox Church and uh, Methodist Church and everything. And then the tagline at the bottom is something like, do you see these terms in the Bible? If you don't, it's not the real church. Our church is the real church because it was founded in AD 33. And so uh, the cornerstones on some church buildings have established AD 33 on it. Uh, T-shirts established AD 33. You know, uh, we really, you know, eat that whole thing up. And so the question I had for you is, um, you know, how would you answer this question? When did the churches of Christ begin? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, again, listeners, if, if you're, intrigued by daniel's kind of summary there i, I do go into a, bit, a little bit more detail in the book it'll probably be a little bit more polished than, than what i'm about to say here um <laughs> not trying to to gin up book sales here but uh, <laughs> again if you, if you are interested that's a good good place to check um but you know when we when we try to figure out and, and to establish a time you know when did the church of christ begin if i say only ad 33 um and uh you know and, and kind of assume kind of an unbroken you know chain that it's existed since then the, the shortcoming with that at least as i see it is that it it doesn't take into account how we can then be part of a restoration movement right so the implication with the ad 33 uh side of things is that okay well it was started in 33 and it's been there since but if, if it has been, then what exactly are we, are we claiming to restore, right? Because the idea of restoration is that there was something there, it was not there, and so then we are kind of restoring or bringing back that thing that was lost. And this, you know, in different groups takes different forms, um, but again, it's the idea that there was something, something was lost, something has been found, again, in sort of the stores of the past. And so, again, you, you can't have the 33 date and also say restoration movement. Conversely, though, if we say it's only Second Great Awakening, it's only 1830s uh, going forth, first, it, it, it ignores right that, that something does happen at Pentecost, right? That, that, that there is something new, right, as the Holy Spirit moves, uh, you know, as we're working through the, the apostles and, and preaching and this, this, this thing appears, which is a wonderful thing. It sort of ignores that kind of uh, side of it, but it also uh, has the shortcoming um, of, of ignoring that we're not the only restorationist group and that we are building on things, um, you know, that the, the, the reformers and others uh, kind of within the broader uh, history of, of the church, of the Christian tradition, you know, broadly speaking, uh, important contributions that were made there too. Uh, so again, I hope it doesn't sound like a mealy mouthed answer because I, I really do believe that that both sides of the coin are important. Um, but it's just making sure that we can that we we are clear with our terms and 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 what we mean by by founded and established. And uh, you know we can say kind of in a theological sense, the Church of Christ, um, again, Pentecost, um, but also Churches of Christ, Restoration Movement Heritage, right? That that is a you know. It, it is its own thing too, right? That that to really understand kind of where we in our, our you know kind of multi multifaceted identity as a religious group, um, yeah. we wanted to take into account both both sides of those. Yeah, so let's let's talk for a moment about this this phrase Church of Christ. Um, yeah. We know obviously that 
we identify each other as Churches of Christ. Uh, if someone were to go to Tuscaloosa, they could find your congregation by looking up Churches of Christ in the well, not the phone book anymore, um, and not and probably not the directory Churches of Christ in the United States, uh, but probably Google, right? They would Google Church of Christ, and a list would come up, and they would pick the one with the top reviews, and then go and look online and make sure it kind of is the Church of Christ they're looking for, then they'd show up. <laughs> um, but how would this have worked like before the Stone Campbell movement? Because weren't there people who identified themselves as Church of Christ? And like, how do we distinguish between that and the Church of Christ we know today? Like, is there a difference? Yeah, well, and, and that's, uh, <laughs> that, that is sort of the, the difficulty, right? And uh, sometimes you'll, you'll see, and I talk a little bit about this in the first chapter of the book as well, is that if you kind of go back through the historical record, you know, particularly, you know, in, in England and elsewhere, you can find people using the name of Church of Christ. Uh, and of course, they get it, you, know, you go back to the New Testament and find the churches of Christ, right? Yeah. You know, in, in the plural, um, you know, there. Um, but, right, what they're, what they're sometimes referring to, their own identification, right, might be something very different. Um, you know, I give an example in the book, uh, you know, of a group of Puritans, right, who in a lot of ways really kind of anticipate, you know, our own kind of movement's heritage. Um, but, right, they're also talking about, like, infant baptism, right? Yeah. That, you know, it, it, yeah. that, that would be sort of anathema, right, for, you know, within the majority of churches of Christ. It's, an, it's not believer's baptism, right? It, it's something very uh, different. And so again, that's the difficulty, right, with, with, with trying to do some of this, where you have terms um, where different people are applying different meanings to them, right? For, for some to use Church of Christ, it means a very small sub-segment of, of something that emerged from the Restoration Movement. You can also use Church of Christ to describe all of Christendom, right? I, it, that that it, it has, you know, a kind of a universal sense to it as well, and, and that just you know, we have to be careful when we read, uh, and you mentioned also kind of, you know, the historical record, um, you know, this is another place where you see kind of scholars drawing some, you know, different conclusions, historians and armchair historians drawing some different conclusions about, you know, where do, where does the kind of the story of the restoration movement begin? Because, you know, Stone and Campbell, right, you know, we, we use the term Stone and Campbell movement, we talk a lot about Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone, but they were influenced by ideas as well, right? <laughs> yeah. Barton Stone, shows up at Cane Ridge, for instance, right, he's not running the show, right, yeah. right? He, he, he is present, but he's not the only, he, he's not sort of a, necessarily the architect uh, of, of everything there, um, you know, Campbell is influenced uh, quite a bit by the ideas of the Scottish Enlightenment, his training, um, you know, overseas before he comes to the United States, right, there are people who are already heading down in some ways a path that, that maybe Stone and Campbell you know, in their own ways, kind of go a little bit further down. Um, but yeah, it, it's just sort of tra tracking the ideas, um, you know, being careful and thinking about how people are using terms, you know, and, and really I do more of this in the in the dissertation book, but it's, it's trying to, uh, trying to understand when people are using specific phrases, where they use a phrase like Church of Christ, or they use a phrase like I talked about in that particular book, um, you know, the early church, right, if they say we want to be like the early church, right, um, what do they have in their heads, right? When they say early church, um, what is their vision of what they are aiming at? And that's why I get that phrase redrawing the blueprints, which is to sort of say like, if they've got a schema of what they understand the early church to be, right? I could be saying I'm restoring the early church and you could be saying that you're restoring the early church. But if we're working essentially from two different kind of mental images of what we're trying to, to return to, we're going to end up with two very different looking things uh, in, in the yeah. present day. And so, again, it's just trying to occupy that headspace, being careful, uh, you know, and, and reading widely in our sources to make sure we understand how they're using uh, different terms at different times. Yeah, if someone says early church and they mean the church fathers and restoring the creeds or whatever, then that's going to look a lot different than ex restoring, uh, you know, just a sola scriptura church that follows a regulative principle you know or whatever you know yeah so the even going from like the, the the new testament to kind of that that you know you start you're bringing in like first clement the didache <laughs> yeah. you know largely similar but there are some places where you see some differences and uh you know in, in different ways that you can you know even where you draw the line on that right yeah. it, you know can, can can have some some pretty significant uh, implications, but both people be using early church, right? So you, know, you also see apostolic church or New Testament church, um, you know, in, in similar <laughs> similar contexts, and 
you know, trying to parse all of these different terms. Uh, you know, I guess that's why they pay us the big bucks to do this, you know, church, church historians, yeah. right? There you go. Yeah. Well, I'm, the reason why I asked that question is because uh, I'm going to put some resources in the uh, description uh, for the episode. And one of the resources I was going to suggest was Thomas Campbell's Declaration and Address, uh, which, you know, is one of uh, what Leroy Garrett would call one of our founding documents, along with, you know, the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the uh, Springfield dress, and, yeah, 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 all that. So, anyways, <laughs> I was going to put that in the in the description, but I know that in his uh, uh, in his paper there in his essay, he talks about the Church of Christ, you know. And when you read that as a member of the Church of Christ, you're going, "Yeah, go get them," you know. But you have to keep in mind that there wasn't these three churches: the Church of Christ, the Disciples of Christ, and the Christian Church at that point. You know, this was before Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone had even really gotten started with a lot of that. And so I wanted to throw that out there just so people are aware that just because you see a phrase, like you said, like early church or restoration or church of Christ, that mean, that may mean very different things to different people. Restoration movement, restoration could mean restoring something that was completely lost. You know, the church wasn't in existence besides maybe a few people we could vaguely point to and say they believed exactly what we believe throughout history. Um, and thank goodness we came along and restored it. Or it could mean the church has always existed, but we're restoring to the church certain principles or methods or ideas that were lost in time. Um, you mentioned a second ago that there were some people who were sort of forerunners to the restoration movement. Um, I know personally I had read a collection of essays uh, and stories about Abner Jones put together by Bradley Cobb. Uh, he has some website with a lot of uh restoration uh, documents you can go and read and uh, buy his collections of books and things like that. Uh, and I really enjoyed his story, uh, this medical doctor who goes into ministry. It was really cool. Um, who are some other forerunners of Stone and Campbell and why might it be good to go back and consider what they had to say as well? Yeah, well, I, I think one of the ways that, that might be helpful for readers to sort of parse this question is to, to go back to the writings of Stone and Campbell in that kind of generation first and see who they talk about and how they talk about people that sort of came before them. Um, because again, they have lots of contemporaries that that are that are you know preaching some of the similar things as them, that they're kind of that are, you know, sort of kicking against the goads, if you will, uh, of kind of some of their traditions, sort of theological, you know positions that they, they, they have been raised with in different ways in, in kind of different parts of church tradition that they that they're kind of rejecting kind of moving away from for various reasons um but this kind of fits into a larger story within the restoration movement which is how do we relate to you know the reformation right luther calvin zwingli right and, and to see how some of the early uh members of what we would call the restoration movement deal with some of those earlier figures you know three centuries, you know, three centuries plus uh, yeah. before their own time um, might give us a little bit different perspective, right? That, that in many cases, these early restorers, if you want to, you know, kind of think about like 1830s, 1840s on, speak very highly of, you know, Luther especially, um, yeah. that, that they don't necessarily always see themselves as like, it's been a complete barren wasteland <laughs> yeah, until yeah. now. And thank goodness I'm here. There, there, that there, you can find some of that too, right? Like again, that's the, the kind of our point earlier about how how varied uh, kind of these restoration writings can be. Um, but for many, right, that they, they don't see themselves as like, you know, I'm appearing in sort of the Deus Ex Machina kind of thing, yeah. right? <laughs> Where it's just out of nowhere, I have suddenly restored the church. They see themselves as part of an ongoing process of like, okay, well, Luther took this step. And, you know, Zwingli took this step and, you know, and, and John Wycliffe took this step and, you know, and, and so many others. It's not exactly chronological order there, but a bit, but again, the, yeah. the point being that, you know, for many of them, they see what they're doing as part of a much longer and much broader um, process, whether or not they would then try to kind of landmark Baptist style, kind of find points, you know, to, to sort of argue for an unbroken succession of the church, right? They, they certainly see themselves as, as part of something uh, larger than themselves, going not just forward in time, but also going backward in time. Yeah, that's that's one thing that I've had to come to realize as well in my own faith journey is I believe the things that I believe, not because like I discovered them myself, but because of principles principles instilled within me by previous generations that had principles instilled within them. And 
Campbell and Stone and Walter Scott and all these uh, figures that we study about in restoration movement history couldn't have done the things that they did without John Locke, uh, you know, without Luther, without Calvin. And while we can be quick to judge, you know, they, they were standing on the shoulders of giants. And admitting that gives us a huge dose of humility. It also gives us a respect that Christianity and, you know, is a, is a conversation. You know, we have to lean on each other and learn from each other and depend upon each other. We all have different fields of study. Not everybody's a history guru like yourself, you know, and not everybody, um, you know, is antagonistic and gets on everybody's nerves like I do. I mean, you know, we all have different roles. And so we have to, <laughs> so we have to lean on each other for support and, and learn to uh, learn to, learn together as a community you know i i recall revelation chapter one uh blessed is he who reads and those who hear uh learn listening to the scripture and studying scripture in community is so big and so i'm definitely thankful for uh, some of the thoughts there uh the other uh founding document that i was going to mention a second ago that i forgot was the last will and testament of the springfield presbytery it slipped my mind uh, they're in one volume and so i just call it the declaration and address and pull it off the shelf but it's actually uh, two different works that are that are formative in our uh, history you want to you said yeah it's yeah like, it's it really like quickly the, the, the yeah. last will and testament of springfield presbytery is a really interesting document because it sort of reflects you know for barton stone and, and richard mcnamara and some of the others that are kind of associated uh with him at least in, the, in that, that particular stage of his life and his ministry um that they're kind of continuing to move away kind of from um sort of presbyterian roots uh that they, they kind of you know, Stone, you know, post Hayne Ridge, he's asking questions, he's sort of struggling with some of the uh, the teachings of, of, of his church home, um, and, you know, he and some like-minded folks kind of separate themselves, you know, are separated slash separate themselves from larger kind of pre Presbyterian uh, framework, establish an independent Presbytery of their own, and then in the last will and testament of the, pres of the Springfield Presbytery, they are abolishing even that level um, with yeah. the idea of, of kind of being subsumed into the body of Christ, body of Christ yes. as a whole I love um, that, that, language that it, it's too. like a it's a legal document but it's also a little kind of tongue-in-cheek right that, that they're yeah. you know writing a as if the, as if this you know presbytery itself has the life of its own and it, it, it's gonna this is this is what needs to happen after the after the presbytery passes away it's gonna it's a will and testament um yeah. but again the goal is kind of being you know incorporated into to something larger right it, it's uh yeah. you know larger than, than what it was previously um good good stuff to read and again um, you know, it's one of those things you have to kind of keep in mind where in Stone's kind of scope and his his journey of his of his own faith, you know, this this is, you know, relatively early in the process uh, for him, uh, but it is still, uh, there's a reason why uh, historians and, and some of the others kind of within the, the Stone Campbell movement uh, have, have pointed to this as, as a particularly important document. It's important to Stone, Stone's important to the movement as a whole. Um, yeah. and, and you can do worse than to, to spend some time reading it, as well as the declaration and address that, that we mentioned earlier. Oh, yeah. I mean, even if if you don't have time to read all of the declaration and address, even his bullet points that he gives close to the start of the document are just awesome uh, and were yeah. really encouraging to me. So, yeah, I would definitely go and uh, look at that. Um, we may have to have you back for a future uh, episode. I know that you have responsibilities, especially of being finals week and uh, appointments and things like that to attend to. I have the same thing going on. I told you, and I'll, I'll tell the audience this right quick. Uh, last night, uh, now this is, we're recording this at the 1st of December, and this isn't going to be published until probably February because we have a lot of episodes in the uh, queue here. But uh, last night before Bible class, we learned that five of our youth were in a major car accident on the way to Bible class. And so I've got a lot going on today, and uh, John does too. And so we're going to kind of wrap this up. But before we do, let's just sort of go to that last question I sent you. Um, what are some questions that the churches of Christ uh, need to answer now? You know, what challenges are we facing? Uh, what do we do um, in the context of church membership decline in the West? What unique position may the Church of Christ be in to answer some of those, uh, you know, some of those troubling statistics and questions about the future and things like that? Yeah, uh, so to, to, to first answer, I'll, I'll point listeners in the direction of a book that will soon be in print, not by me. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll plug someone else's book here, um, but it is a, an updated and revised version uh, of Reviving the Ancient Faith, originally written by Richard Hughes, uh, but Jamie Gorman uh, at Johnson University in Tennessee is uh, in the process, uh, I guess it's probably with the publisher now, but uh, 
uh, of kind of revising and expanding that. And and it's a history of Churches of Christ, kind of a, an intellectual doctrinal history um, uh, of Churches of Christ. And uh, his additional chapter is really going to bring uh, the story to the present day. I had the opportunity to uh, in, his, in the process of his research, he interviewed a number of people affiliated with or, or, or formerly affiliated with the Churches of Christ. And uh, so there's actually a recording of me talking about this at greater length, floating around somewhere else on, online, I guess, uh, with some Google food, someone could find it. Um, but in, in short, right, in recent uh, years, recent decades, um, demographically, right, as, as, a, as a religious body, Churches of Christ, particularly in the U.S., uh, it's a, it's just it's a time of numerical decline, right? Both in terms of numbers of adherents, regular attendees, but also numbers of congregations. And uh, work such as Stan, Stanley Granberg's article, uh, which is has been widely read, widely cited, article from the Great Commission Research Journal, uh, but even other scholarship as well, it, you know, it, you know, Pew Research, others, you know, it paints a, a clear picture of uh, of numerical decline. Now, across Churches of Christ, people will disagree as to the reasons for that. But I think one place where I am heartened, um, despite concern about numbers, right, concern about, you know, long time, you know, long term sort of feasibility of, of, of the religious body, kind of from a purely numerical standpoint, is that in a way that I have not seen in my lifetime in terms of Christ, people are starting to take that seriously. And it looks different in different corners of the movement. In some places, it's church planting. In some places, it's kind of a renewed emphasis on discipleship and trying to to pick up sort of the the the, the best parts of the legacy of the Boston movement of the ICOC, kind of from the from this late seventies into the nineties, uh, you know, and trying to to make where discipleship isn't a dirty word, right? In churches of Christ, uh, as it has been for for a time. Um, there's you know you know house church again. In, in some corners of the movement also, it, it's sort of a renewed, you know, we're, we're sort of digging in, you know, we're, we're not changing, we're going to hold firm to who we have been and so forth. Again, the response looks different in different places. And without sort of weighing in on, on kind of, you know, which of these paths or, you know, path or paths I, I think is best, uh, from a historical standpoint, I think it's important that we see kind of across the board, people are starting to, to kind of wake up and say, hey, um, you know, we grew a lot at, at certain points in our history, you know, <laughs> Yeah. The 1950s is always pointed to as this kind of this golden age or whatever. Um, but we can't, you know, for whatever reasons we grew in the 1950s, we can't coast on those laurels now, right? If we want to continue to exist, we want to continue to, to witness for Christ to the world, right? We've got to do something. Yeah, and, right. Uh, it, it, it at least it is encouraging to me um, that people are, are starting to ask those kinds of questions. And again, the solutions in some ways are, are sort of mutually exclusive, right? Different parts of churches of Christ are are going to reckon with that question in different ways. Um, I guess another one, and we didn't talk so much about, you know, the the, the impact of the Civil War on the Stone Campbell movement, but, but thinking about, uh, you know, kind of living, you know, for those of us in the U.S., living in an in increasingly, um, you know, partisan, politicized, uh, you know, you know, that's our context for where we uh, live and we do our work, and, and you know, thinking about how the church can thoughtfully, um, you know, survive and engage with people, um, you know. While, while acknowledging kind of very real political policy and, and, and other kind of differences, um, but also trying to, you know, to navigate, you know, sometimes divisions in the larger society, uh, but also divisions within individual congregations, right? You know, people, you know, having congregations for people who, you know, voted for Trump and voted for Bernie, right? In, in, you know, in the same, uh, in, in the same uh, building. Uh, yeah. and, and again, um, I won't say that this is the most politicized time in american history because we did have a civil war after all um yeah. but uh you know in, in ways that maybe we haven't we didn't necessarily see quite as much through you know, the 90s and you know in other times in our history um you know that sort of really hyper partisanship is something that that the church as a whole is really going to have to, to reckon with and hopefully uh in, in a thoughtful way um yeah but we'll see yeah i appreciate that and i was looking at that civil war question and thought you know, maybe we need to have a repeat up, you know, another episode on down the road where we talk about that and how it relates to race relations and political relations in the 21st century. Um, I think that'd be awesome if you would be willing to come back and do that sometime in the future when things yeah, calm down yeah. a little bit. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's one of those things we may have to go ahead and start trying to put it on the calendar now because I think this is our, our third, this was our third or fourth attempt uh, to try to get together uh, to chat today. And uh, Between... know, if, if we go ahead and start start prepping and, and planning for it now, uh, we, maybe we'll get we'll get it out uh, by the end of 2023. Yeah, y'all had RSV, we had flu, my wife got pneumonia, y'all had stomach bugs, ear aches, all this stuff. It's been, it's been something else, but hey, I am. Yeah, so- yeah, to- toddler life is a, is a real shock to the system, uh, especially Dude. for me working remotely. I, I, I contribute approximately 0% to the collective immune response of my house. I've been working remotely for like five years now. And so, yeah. um, you know, I, I have like no, you know, no resistance to any of this stuff that's floating around apparently. So. Oh, yeah, well. Man, thank you so much for coming on the interview today. I just appreciate you so much. And um, before you go, though, don't you have one more website you didn't tell us about? <laughs> yeah, this is the thing that I'm probably actually best known for. Uh, but it is the Church of Christ Celebrities blog. Uh, this is the uh, the the most widely read thing by you know an order of magnitude at least at least one order of magnitude. Uh, yeah. compared to anything else I've ever written. Uh, but yeah, it, it's uh, churchofchristcelebrities.wordpress.com. Uh, and essentially what I do there, it, it's sort of tongue in cheek, uh, but, uh, but you know, you, you grow up and you hear people claiming like, oh, this person is, is Church of Christ or she's Church of Christ or or, or whatever else. And, uh, you know, what I try to do there is um, I, I'm not interested in policing the borders of the Church of Christ doctrinally. Uh, yeah. But what I what I tried to to do is to look and see, you know, did this person have some connection to Churches of Christ? Did they grow up in it? Did they spend time there? Um, you know, are are they still part of it in in some way? You know, are they connected in some way to one of the movements, universities, or schools? Uh, yeah. and that that's often the case. And uh, so again, it's sort of a MythBuster style thing. Yeah. Uh, your readers will suggest a, a particular person, uh, or, or a group of people, and uh, and I'll. And I'll kind of, you know, do a little bit of digging. It's not my most scholarly work, uh, but again, it is the thing that uh, is probably uh, most, it's certainly most widely read. Um, C- celebrities so. have a lot easier time placing membership in the Church of Christ than most people who try to place membership with the Church of Christ. <laughs> the, uh... yeah, yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, we, we, we sort of are, are, are reaching out and embracing with open arms. It's like, oh, that's a famous person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> let's, let's claim them whether or not they actually have any kind of, you know, in, in some of the cases, it's like, okay, one time they, they were in a car and they drove by a Church of Christ, you know, but for some, it's like, you know, actually, you know, they're, they're a real, you know, kind of meaningful, uh, you know, engagement with and, and some that, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, ha- have really been very involved in the lives of their congregations. Um, but, it, but it is interesting, you know, again, growing up for me, it was always Weird Al and Pat Sajak uh, yes. were the two that, that were most frequently mentioned. Uh, Yankovic, yes, Sajak, no, but readers can, uh, can go to the blog and find more. Yeah, I actually uh, was able to hang out with one of the ministers at the church that, yeah, uh, Weird Al is a member of. That's pretty cool. Um yeah. I, uh, I used to go to church with someone, uh, used to be part of a congregation with someone uh, when I was in, living in Florence who had also been a member of that same congregation. And yeah. someone asked him one time, he was like, what's it like going to church with Weird Al? And he's like, well, we didn't call him Weird Al, we just called him Al. You know, <laughs> you know, it, it, you know it's just like, he's just, he's just, he's just there. He, but he would participate. And uh, he did also mention that someone would, there, there was a person who would, you know, I don't know if stalker is quite the right word for it or just a really devoted fan, but she yeah. would come and she would sit in the back and she would kind of <laughs> be there in the car she, now she was only there because Yankovic was there um yeah. but you know perhaps perhaps a, a gospel seed was planted uh, uh, yeah. uh through, through, through the fandom of, of, of comedic music we'll see the guy the guy who wrote the saga begins serve me communion yes. that's awesome yeah well yes. hey uh again thanks so much for joining us i'll put all the links that we talked about in the description below and if you could even send me the interview you did about uh reviving the ancient faith then i'll love to put that in the description and send the listeners to that as well uh but to all you people who tune in week by week we're so thankful for you and thankful for uh your devotion to god and your love for seeking truth and your uh, love for christ and also for your support of this podcast we appreciate you so much have a great day everyone we'll see you next uh next episode and god bless